Hello and welcome back to my series on the eschatology of John. I hope you appreciate these video recordings. Um, I feel like video gets a little more views and interaction than audio does. And even though I'm reading off the screen, I hope it's at least a little more uh, easy, easier for you to follow and click and watch when you can like see stuff moving around <laughs> instead of just a blank screen. Okay, let's get right into it. We'll start the audio recording part of it now. She thought he was the gardener. The eschatology of John, part six. An Overview of John, Part 5 The Incarnation reveals that God is love by showing that God can dwell with sinners. Humans were designed to coexist with God. Jesus, as the Word of God, is what God has to say about himself. The signs of Jesus reveal God's compassion and love for us. They also tie together Israel's story and point towards new creation. The teaching of Jesus reveals God loves God's love for us through seven different I am these statements that relate to people across cultures. Jesus is the good shepherd, but he is also the light. Jesus is the bread from heaven, but he is also the vine. He is not just the source of life. He is life itself. The death of Jesus reveals that God has no limits when it comes to demonstrating love towards us. Jesus was abandoned by his disciples, the very ones for whom he died, but he was not left alone because the Father was with him. John 16, 32. Now we come to the resurrection of Jesus. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Robert Lowry, 1874. The power to take it up. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father, John 10, 17-18. Jesus didn't die because the Father abandoned him. Jesus didn't die because he lost his power, because he was betrayed, or because he was outsmarted. Jesus died because he wanted to. It was totally within his power. He never lost control. And, and had he lost control, the force of his death would be lost. Lion and the Lamb In the book of Revelation, John calls Jesus the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But when John sees Jesus in the vision, he doesn't see a lion, he sees a lamb that was slain. The point here isn't that Jesus came as a lamb at one point and that later, later he'll appear as a lion. Instead, the point is that Jesus only appears as a lion when he appears as a lamb. It is when he humbles himself to the point of death that he is at his strongest. Later in Revelation, when Jesus appeared as a mighty conqueror who rides a white horse and bears a great sword, it is important to note several features of this vision. Number one, his robe was covered in blood, which is his own blood, not the blood of his enemies. Number two, his name, the Word of God, reminds us of the entire story of the gospel, how the Word took on flesh for the purpose of sacrificial death. The great sword that he bears comes out of his mouth. It is his words that strike down the nations, not sharp still. The relationship between power or authority and sacrificial death is inseparable. Jesus' ultimate expression of his power and authority was through willingly laying down his life. As an aside, it's important to note that scriptural leadership looks the same. Leaders in the church should be recognized for their humility, sacrifice, and selflessness. As Jesus taught in Mark 9, arguments about who is the greatest have no place in the kingdom. God commanded resurrection. As Jesus said in the text in John 10, Jesus had the authority, exousia, to both lay down his life and take it up again. This, he said, was a command of God. In John, the death of Jesus is so necessary because it is a prerequisite to resurrection. In order for Jesus to fully identify with humanity, he had to conquer death and dispel death's power. Physical death has been one of humanity's greatest fears, a fear which has stemmed from our ignorance of who God actually is. Had we known God as Jesus has known God from before the world began, death would have always been embraced as a sweet reunion. We would have known that, quote, even though they die, they will live, John eleven twenty five. 25. 
we would have known that any suffering we face today is not able to be compared with the glory found in Christ. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Romans 8, 18. So Jesus being in on the plan from the beginning was obedient. I was obedient to death so that we might be released from the fear of death. The Hebrews writer says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. See following Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. But Jesus' obedience to the Father did not come from a place of fear, and it wasn't a matter of submitting to a higher authority. These kind of labels don't adequately describe the relationship between the Father and the Son. In John 10, we see that Jesus obeyed the Father because of the love the Father had for the Son from before the foundation of the world, John 10, 17. The translation here is a little troubling, though, for it makes it seem as if the Father's love for the Son is transactional or conditional. The scripture says, For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. John 10, 17. Uh, Borkert in the New American Commentary argues, It would be highly unlikely that either Jesus or John would have based the love of the Father for Jesus on the Son's casual willingness to die. Instead, the love of the Father would more likely have led to the Son's willingness to die for the sheep. Therefore, I would reverse the idea and read the text of John 17 as, Because... The Father loves me. That is the reason, or therefore, I lay down my life. The model of the Father provided the model for the Son, which in turn should provide the model for the followers of Jesus. See following John 13, 34 and John 15, 12. The resurrection, like the death of Jesus, was an expression of God's love. The point about transactional obedience and obedience that stems from love And a mutual ethic is important because it changes how we view our relationship with God. But it also challenges popular leadership structures in churches, businesses, and families. A husband is to love his wife just as Christ loves the church. A boss is to be kind to his employees, pay fair wages on time, and not treat them like a lesser person. A church leader is to serve the congregation as Christ shepherds the church. Peter said, Now as an elder myself and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it, not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. 1 Peter 5, 1-3 As you can see from a few examples I've given so far, eschatology shapes ethic. How we read and interpret scripture can have profound impacts in every area of our lives. Bad theology manifests itself as bad fruit. Church leaders abuse power, husbands and wives have dysfunctional relationships, and business leaders use their employees because they don't have a relationship with Jesus' Father. Studying scripture is more than an academic exercise. It is about transforming the way we see everything as well as how we live in the world. He was resurrected in a garden. Mary Magdalene. Before Jesus died, he took his disciples into a garden. John 18, verse 1. Soon after their arrival, Judas showed up with a detachment of of soldiers to arrest Jesus. After the crucifixion, John wrote, Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. They laid Jesus there. John 19, 41 and 42. The next day, a series of disciples visited the tomb. Mary Magdalene had reported that the tomb was empty. And after they returned, uh, Mary remained alone, weeping outside the tomb. Then she saw two angels sitting where Jesus' body had been lying. They asked her why she was weeping, and in the middle of her response, she turned and saw Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, Why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. John 20, 14 to 15. She thought he was the gardener. Why? Because Jesus was buried in a garden, and John really wanted us to get this point. But why? 
because Jesus has come to retell the story of Adam. That's why the gospel starts off with a creation story. That's why there are all these sets of sevens throughout this gospel account, such as the seven miracles and the seven I am these statements. And that's why Jesus' last moments before his, his arrest, as well as his resurrection, took place in a garden. Jesus is the way back to Eden and to the Father. The cross is the tree of life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus bruised the head of the serpent through his death and resurrection. The new creation has broken forth into the old creation in the life of Jesus, and you and I are invited to participate in it. The breath of life. After Jesus' conversation with Mary, he commissioned her to go and tell the good news to his disciples. Later that day, Jesus came to his disciples, offered proof that it was him, and did something theatrical. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. John 20, 21-22 Jesus breathed on his disciples to act out what had happened in the garden earlier that day, but also to act out what had happened in a different new creation story in Israel's scriptures. In Genesis 2, when God made Adam, he, quote, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In the Septuagint, the word for breathe is the same word employed in John 20, 21 to 22. In Fusao. <clears throat> I don't th it's always easier to read the actual Greek instead of the transliteration, like I have in the text. <laughs> I don't think the connection here is intentional. Jesus is reenacting the creation story and inaugurating a new creation. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Jesus was raised that others might be raised. A seed that remains unsown dwells alone, but a seed that falls to the ground and dies produces much fruit. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, he was offering them resurrection life. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is an agent of life and comfort throughout John's Gospels. In John 3, John 4, and John 7, the Holy Spirit is called the water of life. In John 14 through 16, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Comforter or the Advocate. The cross of Christ, which is the tree of life, and the Holy Spirit, who is the water of life, work together to bring about God's new creation. Now, what does this mean for us, that you might have life? Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. John 20, 30 to 31. In the study, we've looked at how the incarnation, the teaching of Jesus, the signs of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus were all recorded for one purpose, that through believing we might have life in his name. Every bit of this book is an invitation to a new way of living. It's an invitation to start over with a new life. It's an invitation to die with Jesus to the old world and be resurrected with him in the spirit. No longer do we have to dwell within our delusion. No longer do we have to believe in a God who is distant. Jesus is risen and everything has changed. The ruler of this world has been judged and our sins have been taken away. Jesus, having been lifted up, draws all people to himself. Nobody is excluded. No tribe is better than the other. No nation or race or language is superior. God is all and in all. Humanity's one hope has been realized in Jesus, and we get to bask in the glory of what he accomplished, the glory of the Father's only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. Now, you need to be like Mary Magdalene and the other disciples. Go and tell other people in your life who God really is, as has been revealed in Jesus. Go and tell them that they are loved and desired, that God wants them to work in this new creation because Jesus was resurrected in a garden and the new creation is here. Having completed now our overview of John, we will turn to specific eschatological statements within John's gospel. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you enjoy the series, I ask that you please interact with it. Uh, like, put a like on YouTube. I'll put a heart on Substack. I'll leave a comment on either of those places as well. Send me a message telling me what you like about it. And anything you can do to tell me that you're listening and, and watching and enjoying this, because it is a lot of effort to produce these uh, weekly articles and audios and videos. And so I would really appreciate if you would interact with it, at least in some way, 
just so I had the motivation uh, to keep producing this material. Hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening and God bless.